Chapter Three of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. The flames leaped high from the fire in the windless gorge. Men sat around it in a great circle, the wild riders out of the mountain valleys of Mech. They sat with the curbed and shivering eagerness of wolves around a dying quarry. Now and again their white teeth showed in a kind of silent laughter, and their eyes watched. "'He is strong,' they whispered one to the other. "'He will live the night out, surely.' On an outcrop of rock sat the Lord Kiaran, wrapped in a black cloak, holding the great axe in the crook of his arm. Beside him Otar huddled in the snow. Close by the long spears had been driven deep and lashed together to make a scaffolding, and upon this frame was hung a man, a big man, iron-muscled and very lean, the bulk of his shoulders filling the space between the bending shafts. Eric John Stark of Earth, out of Mercury. He had been scourged without mercy. He sagged of his own weight between the spears, breathing in harsh sobs, and the trampled snow around him was spotted red. Thord was wielding the lash. He had stripped off his own coat, and his body glistened with sweat in spite of the cold. He cut his victim with great care, making the long lash sing and crack. He was proud of his skill. Stark did not cry out. Presently Thord stepped back, panting, and looked at the Lord Kiaran, and the Black Helm nodded. Thord dropped the whip. He went up to the big dark man and lifted his head by the hair. Stark, he said, and shook the head roughly. Stranger! Eyes opened and stared at him, and Thord could not repress a slight shiver. It seemed that the pain and indignity had wrought some evil magic on this man he had ridden with and thought he knew. He had seen exactly the same gaze in a big snow-cat caught in a trap, and he felt suddenly that it was not a man he spoke to, but a predatory beast. Stark, he said. Where is the talisman of Ban Krushak? The Earthman did not answer. Thord laughed. He glanced up at the sky, where the moons rode low and swift. The night is only half done. Do you think you can last it out? The cold, cruel, patient eyes watched Thord. There was no reply. Some quality of pride in that gaze angered the barbarian. It seemed to mock him who was so sure of his ability to loosen a reluctant tongue. You think I cannot make you talk, don't you? <laughs> you don't know me, stranger. You don't know Thord, who can make the rocks speak out if he will. He reached out with his free hand and struck Stark across the face. It seemed impossible that anything so still could move so quickly. There was an ugly flash of teeth, and Thord's wrist was caught above the thumb joint. He bellowed, and the iron jaws closed down, worrying the bone. Quite suddenly Thord screamed, not for pain, but for panic. And the rows of watching men swayed forward, and even the Lord Kiaran rose up, startled. Hark! ran the whispering around the fire. Hark how he growls! Thark had let go of Stark's hair and was beating him about the head with his clenched fist. His face was white. Werewolf! he screamed. Let me go, beast thing, let me go! But the dark man clung to Thard's wrist, snarling, and did not hear. After a bit there came the dull crack of bone. Stark opened his jaws. Thord ceased to strike him. He backed off slowly, staring at the torn flesh. Stark had sunk down to the length of his arms. With his left hand Thord drew his knife. The Lord Kiaran stepped forward. Wait, Thord. It is a thing of evil, whispered the barbarian. Warlock, werewolf, beast. He sprang at Stark. 
The man in armor moved very swiftly, and the great axe went whirling through the air. It caught Thord squarely where the cords of his neck ran into the shoulder, caught and shore on through. There was silence in the valley. The Lord Ciaran walked slowly across the trampled snow and took up his axe again. "'I will be obeyed,' he said, "'and I will not stand for fear, not of God, man, nor devil.' He gestured toward Stark. "'Cut him down, and see that he does not die.' He strode away, and Otar began to laugh. From a vast distance Stark heard that shrill, wild laughter. His mouth was full of blood, and he was mad with a cold fury. A cunning that was purely animal guided his movements then. His head fell forward, and his body hung inert against the thongs. He might almost have been dead. A knot of men came toward him. He listened to them. They were hesitant and afraid. Then, as he did not move, they plucked up courage and came closer, and one prodded him gently with the point of his spear. "'Prick him well,' said another. "'Let us be sure.' The sharp point bit a little deeper. A few drops of blood welled out and joined the small red streams that ran from the wheels of the lash. Stark did not stir. The spearman grunted, "'He is safe enough now.' Stark felt the knife-blades working at the thongs. He waited. The rawhide snapped, and he was free. He did not fall. He would not have fallen then if he had taken a death wound. He gathered his legs under him and sprang. He picked up the spearman in that first rush and flung him into the fire. Then he began to run toward the place where the scaly mounts were herded, leaving a trail of blood behind him on the snow. A man loomed up in front of him. He saw the shadow of a spear and swerved and caught the haft in his two hands. He wrenched it free and struck down with the butt of it and went on. Behind him he heard voices shouting at the beginning of turmoil. The Lord Ciaran turned and came back striding fast. There were men before Stark now, many men, the circle of watchers breaking up because there had been nothing more to watch. He gripped the long spear. It was a good weapon, better than the flint-tipped stick with which the boy in Chaka had hunted the great lizard of the rocks. His body curved into a half-crouch. He voiced one cry, the challenging scream of a predatory killer, and went in among the men. He did slaughter with that spear. They were not expecting attack. They were not expecting anything. Stark had sprung to life too quickly, and they were afraid of him. He could smell the fear on them, fear not of a man like themselves, but of a creature less and more than a man. He killed and was happy. They fell away from him, the wild riders of Mech, they were sure now that he was a demon. He raged among them with the bright spear, and they heard again that sound that should not have come from a human throat, and their superstitious terror rose and sent them scrambling out of his path, trampling on each other in childish panic. He broke through, and now there was nothing between him and escape but two mounted men who guarded the herd. Being mounted, they had more courage. They felt that even a warlock could not stand against their charge. They came at him as he ran, the padded feet of their beasts making a muffled drumming in the snow. Without breaking stride, Stark hurled his spear. It drove through one man's body and tumbled him off, so that he fell under his comrade's mount and fouled its legs. It staggered and reared up hissing, and Stark fled on. Once he glanced over his shoulder. Through the milling, shouting crowd of men, he glimpsed a dark, mailed figure with a winged mask, going through the ruck with a loping stride and bearing a sable axe raised high for the throwing. Stark was close to the herd now, and they caught his scent. The Norland brutes had never liked the smell of him, and now the reek of blood upon him was enough in itself to set them wild. 
They began to hiss and snarl uneasily, rubbing their reptilian flanks together as they wheeled around, staring at him with lambent eyes. He rushed them before they could quite decide to break. He was quick enough to catch one by the fleshy comb that served it for a forelock, held it with savage indifference to its squealing, and leaped to its back. Then he let it bolt, and as he rode it he yelled a shrill brute cry that urged the creatures on to panic. The herd broke, stampeding outward from its center like a bursting shell. Stark was in the forefront. Clinging low to the scaly neck, he saw the men of Mech scattered and churned and trampled into the snow by the flying pads. In and out of the skelters, kicking the brush walls down, lifting up their harsh reptilian voices, they went racketing through the camp, leaving behind them wreckage as of a storm. And Stark went with them. He snatched a cloak from off the shoulders of some petty chieftain as he went by, and then, twisting cruelly on the fleshy comb, beating with his fist at the creature's head, he got his mount turned in the way he wanted it to go, down the valley. He caught one last glimpse of the Lord Kiaran fighting to hold one of the creatures long enough to mount, and then a dozen striving bodies surged around him, and Stark was gone. The beast did not slacken pace. It was as though it thought it could outrun the alien bloody thing that clung to its back. The last fringes of the camp shot by and vanished in the gloom, and the clean snow of the lower valley lay open before it. The creature laid its belly to the ground and went, the white spray spurting from its heels. Stark hung on. His strength was gone now, run out suddenly with the battle madness. He became conscious now that he was sick and bleeding, that his body was one cruel pain. In that moment, more than in the hours that had gone before, he hated the black leader of the clans of Mech. That flight down the valley became a sort of ugly dream. Stark was aware of rock walls reeling past, and then they seemed to widen away and the wind came out of nowhere like the stroke of a great hammer and he was on the open moors again. The beast began to falter and slow down. Presently it stopped. Stark scooped up snow to rub on his wounds. He came near to fainting, but the bleeding stopped, and after that the pain was numbed to a dull ache. He wrapped the cloak around him and urged the beast to go on, gently this time, patiently, and after it had breathed, it obeyed him, settling into the shuffling pace it could keep up for hours. He was three days on the moors. Part of the time he rode in a sort of stupor, and part of the time he was feverishly alert, watching the skyline. Frequently he took the shapes of thrusting rocks for riders, and found what cover he could until he was sure they did not move. He was afraid to dismount, for the beast had no bridle. When it halted to rest, he remained upon its back, shaking, his brow beaded with sweat. The wind scoured his tracks clean as soon as he made them. Twice in the distance he did see riders, and one of those times he burrowed into a tall drift and stayed there for several hours. The ruined towers marched with him across the bitter land, lonely giants fifty miles apart. He did not go near them. He knew that he wondered a good bit, but he could not help it, and it was probably his salvation. In those tortured badlands, riven by ages of frost and flood, one might follow a man on a straight track between two points. But to find a single rider lost in that wilderness was a matter of sheer luck, and the odds were with Stark. One evening at sunset he came out upon a plain that sloped upward to a black and towering scarp notched with a single pass. The light was level and blood-red, glittering on the frosty rock so that it seemed the throat of the pass was aflame with evil fires. To Stark's mind, essentially primitive and stripped now of all its acquired reason, that narrow cleft, 
appeared as the doorway to the dwelling-place of demons as horrible as the fabled creatures that roamed the dark side of his native world. He looked long at the gates of death, and a dark memory crept into his brain. Memory of that nightmare experience when the talesman had made him seem to walk into that frightful pass, not as Stark, but as Ban Krushak. He remembered Otar's words. I have seen Ban Krushak the Mighty. Was he still there, beyond those darkling gates, fighting his unimagined war alone? Again, in memory, Stark heard the evil piping of the wind. Again the shadow of a dim and terrible shape loomed up before him. He forced a remembrance of that vision from his mind by a great effort. He could not turn back now. There was no place to go. His weary beast plodded on, and now Stark saw, as in a dream, that a great walled city stood guard before that awful gate. He watched the city glide toward him through the crimson haze, and fancied he could see the ages clustered like birds around the towers. He had reached Kushat, with the talesman of Ban Kushak still strapped in the blood-stained belt around his waist. End of chapter 3